Good morning, everyone. All right, so my name is Ryan, and this is Ben. We're from Punch Buggy, which is a Sydney-based digital agency. Today, we're going to take you through a three-year journey that we've taken with the client. It's been an interesting one. They had major growth issues, scalability issues, but it was a WordPress site. But it wasn't just any WordPress site, and it wasn't just steady growth. It was explosive growth. But that's how it was expressed in server response time. So that wasn't a nice sales graph. It was actually the server just saying, no, go away, please. So I had this new client. Awesome. Unfamiliar code base. But we didn't yet know what we're up against. The site was completely unstable. Only had 200 odd active users. Nothing drastic, but it was going down multiple nights a week. The client needed stability and fast. All enthusiastically, we ripped open the bonnet. There were a couple of alarm bells. We were faced with 16,000 lines of functions.php intertwined between the parent and child theme. For anyone that's not a developer here, that's like opening a can of worms. Things weren't looking too promising. We did what most would probably do in this situation. We threw servers at it, literally. After speaking to our hosting provider, we all agreed that being a database-heavy, transactional-based website, the best thing we could do is split the front-end web server and the back-end database server. Seemed logical. Good next step. Ready to take on the world. New servers in place. We're ready for it. Not exactly. Things actually got a little bit worse before they got better. The site was slow, like really slow. 7 p.m., I was sitting on my couch, phone started ringing, uh-oh, what's going on? Opened up the laptop, okay, we've got a bit of an issue. Pulled in the team, everyone was scrambling, okay, let's look at this, what's going on? We had the host saying, oh, it's your code. We had, this, had the developer saying, oh, it's the servers. Okay, boys, calm down, let's just take a step back, what's going on? So we worked together, we had a look at things, we found a few issues. There's a couple of constraints on, well, we, we said the hosting constraints. So there was very large, really large database queries, and they're being throttled by the connection between the, the front end web server and the back end database server that we just put in. <laughs> okay, is that something you think about? The host quickly increased the bandwidth, and that got us out of trouble. We're on, on our way again. Hopefully bandwidth limiting between the back end node and the front end isn't something you'll face in 2018, or maybe on a VPS server potentially, but in 2016 this did happen to us. Caught us out. So adding mobile servers wasn't the instant fix we're after, but things, you know, once the, once the teething issues were out of the way, things did calm down and stabilise, and the site was online for long enough that we could actually start looking at it and optimising. But there wasn't going to be any quick fix for this one. With the servers though, it gave us learnings. We started to understand what we're up against with this code base. Basically a pile of, enthusiastically, we're ready to take this on. Um, and what I'm gonna do is to take you through some, some lessons that we learned while dealing with this code base and dealing with this site and dealing with what was not a great start uh, and what we think is a pretty great finish. And the first lesson that we learned, and we learned it pretty quickly, was to start with the end in mind. And what does that mean? It's going to mean different things to everyone, depending on where they are in their journey, in their business, in their site building. Uh, but basically it means coding for where you want to be and not for where you are. So if your site is growing and it's starting to show the strain, you don't want to be following that growth curve up you want to be coding for where it's going to be in a couple of years so you can watch it approaching, and when it gets close, start moving to the next level. As the image for this, for this slide implies, working this way allows you to get some perspective on the destination, allows you to get some perspective on the journey, and when things get rough, when you get a bit lost on that journey, you can step back, remember this perspective, and get some calm and serenity, right? When we started opening the code base up a bit 
more we realised that our experience was going to be not like this. It was not good. This is what the site looked like. There was a central WordPress installation which had been running a blog for a long time. It had a lot of content, thousands of posts, lots of taxonomy, um, but really pretty straightforward WordPress. It had three e-commerce systems running concurrently. Uh, it had the shop plugin, which was selling physical products. It had a custom system uh, for subscriptions, which is really a bunch of uh, PHP files interacting with the PayPal API to handle payments and renewals and cancellations. Um, and then it had WooCommerce, which had been installed pretty recently with the subscriptions plugin to handle new subscriptions. So the custom PayPal system had been turned off for new subscriptions. But it was still handling renewals and cancellations because their, uh, their uh, subscription tier with PayPal meant that you could not change existing subscriptions at all. If you did, PayPal would essentially regard it as the vendor trying to scam the, the uh, subscriber and instantly cancel the subscription. And that was a really big uh, ongoing revenue stream for them, so we were very cautious about touching that. And the final component uh, was the subscription application itself. These guys are in the health space. It's, it's a, basically a kind of health planning application with meals and exercise and stuff. And it was built with an unholy mix of an MVC framework, uh, some WordPress template integration, some non-WordPress template integration, static files, custom database tables, uh, and giant slabs of operational code dumped into functions.php. Uh, now, that in itself is bad, but also the fact that all these three components of the site were running on the same server made optimizing all those elements very difficult and very complex because they all have different requirements. Optimizing a blog, which is essentially a bunch of basically static content, is very different from optimizing a site to run a WooCommerce installation. Uh, and again, it's different to optimize a custom application, which has a whole lot of other considerations to take into account. So we immediately started to think about what our end was going to be. And this is what we planned. We planned to move the blog content to its own WordPress installation so we could focus on optimizing it, focus on getting it streamlined, give it a new theme which didn't have all the cruft from the existing installation. And we did that. It was pretty simple. It worked well. It's fast. It's good. We like it. Um, we couldn't pull the custom application out very quickly because the code for it was intertwined with every part of the existing site. And we kept finding that we'd make a change somewhere in WooCommerce or in Shop or in the blog and something in the application would break because it was just weirdly connected in ways that were really difficult to fathom. So what we did, because the big problem with the application was that it was not very well written and it was a resource hog. So we decided to outsource the processing by writing a hybrid app uh, that ran on users' phones uh, and tablets. And essentially that outsourced the processing uh, for the uh, custom application. Uh, and the only interaction it had with the site itself and the server was through API calls and fairly kind of easy database updates, inserts selects. Uh, and we obviously, we spent a lot of time writing an API for that, which optimized all of those interactions. And that really reduced the server load of the custom application. Uh, eventually, we, we uh, worked with a, another agency, and they built a second iteration of the app and moved all of the, all of the uh, content and all of the, uh, the code over to a new server. And we were finally rid of that thing. And the third thing we decided to do was to move all the e-commerce operations to WooCommerce and get rid of the other systems. Why do we choose WooCommerce? Well, I'm sure you'll all agree it's a bloody awesome piece of software. I'm constantly astounded that they give it away. Um, for us, it really hits the sweet spot between power and flexibility and usability. 
there are some systems which have greater power, there are some systems which have greater flexibility, but they always run into usability issues for us. They're difficult for the client to maintain, or they're difficult for us to customise, or they're just hard to kind of maintain over time. The other thing about WooCommerce is it has a really powerful and vibrant developer community who build amazing extensions for it to make it do things that even the original developers never envisaged. And one of the reasons it has that community is that WooCommerce is built from the ground up for extensibility. Hooks and actions and filters uh, are its lifeblood. You can customise virtually everything in WooCommerce by writing a filter or an action or a hook. And if you're just getting into WordPress development, I really strongly encourage you to learn what those things are and how to use them because they're so powerful. Um, the other thing about WooCommerce is that the subscriptions plugin, which is made by Prospress, is fan bloody tastic. It handles subscriptions really, really well. Um, when we first got it, it only had a couple of subscription options that were pretty plain. Uh, over time, the client has asked for some really complex subscriptions options and subscriptions hasn't blinked. We've been able to customise it where the functionality isn't built in really easily and it's been able to handle uh, all the demands we've thrown at it uh, really, really well. And we've been talking to the, the guys from Prospress out in the, uh, in the foyer about how they're improving it even more, really excited to see what they're doing with it. So ultimately, WooCommerce we think is great and we trust our client's future with it. And that's the second big learning we had from this process, which is keep the client on board. And by that I don't just mean kind of keep them in the loop. We had to have a very, very difficult conversation with this client. We had to sit them down and obviously they'd been through a lot of stress with the site going down. It was continuing to be problematic and we had to sit them down and say, we are committed to fixing your site which is why it's going to take a while to fix your site, because we're going to do it properly. And that's it's a hard conversation to have because the client wants the thing fixed yesterday. They want to add new features. They want to grow their business. And we did all of that. We worked with them. And what we had to do was to maintain a balance between feature development, between uh, firefighting sometimes, uh, and between improving the fundamentals of the code and fundamentals of the site. We couldn't have done this, we couldn't have built this site the way it has been without the great buy-in we had from the client in the end. And they've been, they've been our partners. When we talk to them about this site now, we talk about our site, we talk about what we're going to do, we talk about what is important to us. It's a really kind of uh, a good relationship um, and, and it's a really, a really joint partnership that's been very powerful. And the third learning, when you're confronted with a, a situation like this, is to look for the biggest bangs. I'm still in the water, mate. Obviously, the code base was full of what looked like low-hanging fruit. There were hard-coded values in functions. There were modifications to WordPress core and, and, and plugins. There were huge chunks of code in the theme itself. As a developer, one of the biggest challenges for us was to see all of these egregious faux pas and not immediately kind of jump in and fix them. Firstly, because sometimes that just broke stuff elsewhere, but also because we had to, again, start with the end in mind. We weren't just fixing pages full of code. What we were doing was to improve the experience of the site for the clients for the, uh, and for their customers. So we looked around for the parts, for the components of the site that were putting the biggest uh, load on the server um, and just address them first. And it's very easy when you've got a complex situation like this to forget the basics. But that blog had been running for a long time and the content managers had not been all that disciplined with their, with their media uploads. So one of the things we did pretty early was to go, there's a lot of really big files in here. Let's, let's compress those. We batch compress those. Um, and with the blog, We've moved their media to a CDN, that's uh, a content delivery network. And what that means is that the traffic globally gets static files from the closest available server. There's a latency benefit uh, and also it reduces the, the 
uh, number of HTTP calls on the, on the server itself. The other thing we did was to immediately start auditing functions.php. 16,000 lines is insane. It is absolutely insane. By comparison, Divi, which is an incredibly complex and powerful theme which has a lot of functionality in, in its functions file, has 9,500 lines. What this means is that there's a megabyte of code that's pre-processed that's, uh, pre, uh, before the rest of the theme even starts to load. And that's not just a static file, it's full of PHP processes, database calls, some of which were well written, most of which weren't. It was an incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly um, resource intensive thing to have sitting at the head of your site. What we did was to pull a lot of that code out and put it into custom plugins. And again, if you're starting to work with, uh, with WordPress as a developer, I really urge you to use custom plugins and not just rely on functions PHP as a kind of repository for new code. Because A, it bloats the site, and B, if your client or you decide to change your theme, you're going to have to do a lot of work to bring that functionality across to the new theme. With a plugin, you don't have to think about it. Over the three years, we've built 20 custom plugins. They're not all active on the site at the moment, but they've all been used at one time or another. We've built a plugin for the API, for example, for the, uh, for the custom application. We've built a custom plugin to talk to their CRM, and we've built plugins that enhance or alter uh, core WooCommerce functionality to make it more performant, to, uh, to get rid of uh, deprecated functions in plugins, uh, and just generally to improve everything about the site. And that's been one of the most powerful changes. That 16,000 line functions file is now 1,600. Uh, and I'm always at the developers to keep getting it down. I'm, I'm, this site has made me functions PHP shy. I, I just, I hate functions PHP now. Um, the other thing we did was to spend a lot of time looking for slow queries, uh, database queries, and inefficient PHP code. And we use Query Monitor a lot in the development environments to do that. It's a great tool. Uh, it'll show you database issues. It'll show you PHP issues, HTTP requests that are erroring out. It'll show you, uh, give you some debugging on AJAX and APIs. Uh, it's a really powerful tool, and I recommend that everyone developing use it all the time in their dev environments. However, don't use it in your live environment, because it does, it does use up a bit of processing power up to 10% on a site as complex as ours, and that's a massive overhead that we could, no way we could afford. Uh, and I'll talk about the, the monitoring tool we use on the live site in a second. We also did a lot of work uh, on the live site with the PHP error logs. We tried to match the server cluster in our dev environment as closely as possible, but it's a big cluster, and it would be prohibitive to actually reproduce it exactly. So, Sometimes PHP performs a little differently on live, and we use the error log uh, on, on live to track those differences and to fix them. But we also use it to make sure that there are no errors, there are no deprecation notices, because they're processor intensive as well. Um, they can, uh, cumulatively, they can have a quite a big impact on your server. And also, um, we wanted to get rid of deprecated functions because we wanted to move to PHP 7 as quickly as possible. When we got the site, it was on PHP 4, uh, sorry, 5.4. We had to really work hard on the uh, application originally to get it to 5.5, which we wanted to do to run opcache. Um, and uh, essentially, we were delayed with PHP 7 until we could get rid ourselves of that application because there was no way we could viably rewrite it for 7. But with all the rest of the code, we were basically writing for PHP 7 almost from the time we got the site. And when we did finally put PHP 7 on there, that is a huge improvement. So if any of you guys are still running uh, your sites on PHP 5.6, or God forbid 5.5, fix it. <laughs> just, just fix it. That's, 7 is, is amazing. Um, in fact, we're now, we're now prepping our implementation of 7.2, because 7 is going to be uh, uh, security end of life in December. Um, the other thing that, to keep on top of is your database indexing. Weird things can happen with database indexing and, and databases in general. We had a, a, right after we got this site, 
we upgraded to WordPress 4.3. And I don't know if anyone else had this experience, but big WooCommerce sites have big post meta tables, like really big post meta tables. We had maybe eight or 10 million rows then. then. We have over 50 million rows now, um, just in post meta, let alone WooCommerce order items and order item meta, which are rushing to catch up. Um, WordPress slightly changed the way PostMeta worked in 4.3. And it was, a, it was an odd change. Basically, the indexed, index was changed to be 191 characters for uh, uh, Meta Key, but the actual uh, field was not. It was still 255. And that mismatch caused huge slowdowns for queries in WP Admin for us. Uh, and there's actually a discussion, you can find this discussion on the, on the WordPress uh, uh, core discussion boards. Um, ultimately, the solution for us was a little bit hacky. We changed the field to be 191 characters, and it was an instant gratification. Um, now, I recommend against doing that. We obviously documented it in a, in a, uh, in a file that we refer to every time we touch the database, and uh, subsequent patches to WordPress have fixed that issue. But sometimes you get an update, and it will break your database in ways that are unexpected, or it'll really affect the performance of your database in ways that are highly unexpected. So keep an eye out for that. Monitoring. It's really important. Um, and we use New Relic, and we use New Relic full stack, which means that it's not only tracking the application stack, PHP, MySQL, it's tracking the, uh, the infrastructure. Um, it's tracking everything. Uh, so the browser side, everything. We can see if one server is having a problem and we can track down why. We can drill down on an error in the application stack and find out where that error is coming from and what it's doing in terms of performance. We can see what errors are cropping up and we can go and fix them really quickly. It's a very powerful tool. Um, it's not a cheap tool, um, but if you, uh, it is licensed per server. So the costs go up, presumably, as your client's sales go up. Uh, and so it, it's not a massive, a massive overhead. But we wouldn't live without it. Um, and one of the good things about it is that you can not only look for problems, but demonstrate wins to the client. And uh, here's, here's an early win. This is a change that we made to the product category page. Uh, which, as you can see, reduced the processing, the PHP processing time from catastrophic to just awful. <laughs> as I say, this was, this was very early on, um, and there's still a huge baseline of, of PHP processing on every page in this site that was just coming from functions. Um, but it was great to be able to show this chart to the client and have them as well experience the, the immediate impact on performance that had. And finally, caching is really important. And when WordPress developers think about caching, we typically think about page caching, which is just taking uh, content that's normally made up of database queries and PHP and making it into a static file and just serving that static file. And that's really important. And we use WP Rocket for that um, uh, throughout the ecosystem for this client. And it does a great job for us. It's very simple and it's very powerful. It's got some great additional tools like cache warming and so forth. Uh, integrates with Cloudflare, which we use on the, on the blog site. Um, it's a great tool. There are other great caching tools. Find one that you really like. Learn how to configure it, because if you configure them wrongly, they're awful. Um, but there are other forms of cache for an application like this. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the two big ones are, are object caching uh, and data caching. Uh, we use opcache for object caching that essentially grabs bits of PHP code and pre-processes them, uh, puts the first time it runs, it gets cached, and, that, and then that script gets, gets uh, run, served from the cache, and not reprocessed again. Uh, same thing with, uh, with data caching. Uh, we use Redis for that, and we found that to be a really, really good tool. Now, there are plugins for, this, for these, both these things on WordPress, but they're not really configuration plugins, they're essentially just ways of connecting WordPress to the cache configuration on the server cluster itself. Uh, and for that, 
uh, for information about that, which is more of a DevOps kind of thing, I'm going to pass you back over to Ryan. All right, back to me. So over the years, we've worked with a bunch of different host hosting providers. Um, we've tried out a heap of different configurations. Uh, they're endless, really. Next up, I'm going to walk you through a, a few optimizations that we've done at a server level uh, that we just couldn't live without. So as men, Ben mentioned, opcache. So this is actually a PHP extension. Um, it caches pre-compiled PHP scripts. So um, if you have a def decent hosting provider, you might already have this enabled, but it is something that has to be installed at the server level. It'll make any WordPress site faster, just straight out of the box. So if you've already got it, awesome. If not, you'll expect a good difference. We have most of the database tables using InnoDB as a storage engine, and we aim to load the entire database in RAM, which makes a huge amount of difference. Actually, <laughs> some of the site probably wouldn't work without that. So again, that's something that you need to work closely with your hosting provider to get to. There's a lot of fine tuning that can be done there at a uh, MySQL level, um, and it gets quite technical, way beyond my skill set. But it's, you need, like I said, you need that, that close relationship to get those sort of things in place. Uh, PHP 7, Ben already touched on this. That was a huge difference. Sites worldwide have, se have seen dramatic changes in the speed which they can process. Um, think of the other layers that we've got. Opcache is also compatible with PHP 7 still, which is great because the two combined, hello, two combined, um, is magic. So stay current and benefit from the new releases of PHP, but for those of you that aren't technical, might just be a website owner, just be careful because your site isn't going to be always compatible with PHP 7 or any new release out of the box. Redis, oh yes, this is another good cache in beauty. Um, but again, one that can catch you out. With a site as big as ours, amount of transactions it's doing, things like that, um, it can bottleneck. You need to be careful on um, time to lives with the caches. Um, so we've put a custom setting in the WPG config file to make sure they're expiring correctly. Beyond two servers, so we're, we're pretty smooth sailing now. It was time to scale. You know, let's push this. So we went from having a single front end web server, as I said before, to a uh, a back-end database server, to now having a sizable cluster. We worked closely with our hosting provider, we looked at the stack, we had the new relic information, all that sort of stuff. We knew what we needed to do. So like, let's do this, let's build the beast. So we ended up with a couple of front-end web servers, which also acted as load balancers. We had a second layer, which was a PHP offload um, servers. And then behind that, we had the database cluster. Um, there's great advantages for this because the, the front end load balancers and web servers also formed uh, a level of caching for us. The PHP layer was great. Um, the, the benefits of having a number of different PHP servers means we can have staggered rollouts with different versions of PHP. So it's not just going to go boom, we're on now PHP 7. We can sort of work that into one server at a time. So we now had the beast, as we called it. We were definitely ready to take on the world this time. Unfortunately, more problems. That infrastructure topology that I just went through, it brings complexity. So all of a sudden, we had issues around deadlocks and locking. We switched the transients to the database table. So I removed the transients to their own database table. And then we switched that to using MySAM instead of InnoDB, as I mentioned before. Uh, that was a good benefit to us. We also had to, read to read, sorry, switch to read committed transactions. Um, these particular items are fairly unique to our environment, so it's not really a textbook sort of blueprint for you to take away and apply. They're pretty unique, but just be mindful of it and sort of be aware of the issues that we've had and why we've had to do it. Lightspeed, Apache, Nginx, we've tried them all. Don't get too hung up on which is going to be the fastest. Optimal performance doesn't come down to a single web server. At the moment, we are using a combination of Lightspeed and Apache. Um, we're in a bit of a hybrid state between physical infrastructure and now the cloud for some level of auto scaling ability. Go with what your hosting provider is comfortable with at the end of the day, because they're the ones that are going to need to support it, add new configs, and when stuff, you know, 
when, when everything falls over, you're going to need them to, to come in and, and put it back together. When you go on TV, this is my favourite bit. I like this one. Working with high traffic and highly complex environments, it's what we do. We like the stress. We like the challenge. And then you get these exciting emails from the television company. Expected traffic surge tonight, 6.30 Sydney time. Awesome. Here we go, boys. TV is actually pretty hard to predict, though. These traffic estimations are so broad. And then typically you find out that, hey, you've been broadcasted to? Hi, Adelaide. Yeah, just Adelaide. OK. Oh. But anyway, nonetheless, you want to be set up for simultaneous connections. So with TV, you're going to expect traffic, and you're going to expect it fast if it does happen. So how much traffic can my site handle at the same time? That's what I'm talking about with simultaneous. Again, you need to work closely with your host. Tell them what's going to happen. There's no use saying two hours before, hey, we're going on TV tonight. They're going to say, good luck. There's not much that they can do at that stage. You need to be prepared. So have a conversation with them. Say, OK, can we do some, some load tension, some benchmarking? What are our limits? What are we even paying for? You know, what's in the contract? And be comfortable in knowing that you at least have a rough number of how many simultaneous connections a site can have. It's pretty important. When you get the right traffic, Yes, traffic patterns. Yeah, they don't nicely increase over a number of hours. That would be cool. The spikes just insanely spiral in a matter of minutes, even seconds. We've seen it going from 100, 200 people on the site, 700 people on the site, 1,000 people on the site, 1,600 people on the site. OK, she's cooking. Looked at the servers. Nah, didn't even blink. Awesome. Um, as you can see, a snapshot out of the real-time view on Google Analytics. So again, this isn't a crazy number. You know, it's 1,600 active users. Obviously, simultaneous connections will be a little bit different. But again, this is a transactional site. You know, that, that could be hundreds of people in the actual checkout doing their thing. So tips for TV. We've learned a few lessons over the time. Use the CDN. It helps offload some of the server work in basic terms. You also want to prepare your caches. We've talked a bit about caches. Um, I also mentioned time to live. With the time to lives, increase them. You know, if they're 30 minutes, you want to extend them for a few hours, enough to sort of get that influx of traffic. So what we do there, we warm them up with a web crawler. We actually use a, a tool called Screaming Frog, which is actually an SEO auditing tool. Pretty damn good one as well. But effectively, it will crawl the site that you tell it to crawl. And it will go through all the URLs. And this is essentially cache warming for us. So we set two targets. We have a cache log at the servers. So we can then crawl the infrastructure, build up the caches there. They're nice and warm. They've got everything on their cache full. And then we also then target the CDN layer. And we can warm that up as well. We then know that we've prepared the best we can. The cache pools are, are full and ready. Hopefully in comes now the traffic. We, we, yeah, we had this thing down now on TV. We knew the drill. Unfortunately, on the way to success, more lessons will be learned. We had a great problem to have, and an unusual scenario to deal with in this case. So due to the nature of the sale, we had visitors adding up to 80 to 85 products to their car order, and this was causing massive slowdowns on the on the, on the site. You could clearly see there's a lot of activity there. So what's going on? We, we, we started pulling it apart. So we worked out, OK, we've got lots of carts. We had hundreds of people in the cart, which equals lots of transients. Then when mixed with multiple products in a single order, that's a large transient to deal with. So we basically had a bottleneck in the checkout. And quite frank, we couldn't do anything about it. We weren't going to just try and fix it when people are still managing the checkout. It was just extremely slow. That motivation for us was to move to Redis. Again, this is a bit of an odd one. You wouldn't typically have single users adding 85 products to your cart, although great if you do. Again, that is a great problem to have, but it's, that was an odd scenario. So worth mentioning. And I've touched on this, but DevOps. There's a bit of a gray area between developers and then hosting providers. 
there's a there's DevOps processes that you need to form in between. And a lot of people just don't think of this. They're like, oh, it's the hosted company's problem. Back to where we started, we're like, it's the servers, now it's the code. You really need to find a host that's willing to have an integrated DevOps role in the project. It's been absolutely instrumental for us. We just couldn't have got to where we are now without their support. We're always brainstorming ways to optimize your configurations, you know, problem solving together, and when things go down, we work as a team, not against each other. It's really helped us to sustain the growth that we've had over the years, and we just couldn't live without that support. Moment of Zen. So I'm talking on this slide even though I haven't looked at it before. So this will be interesting. So as you can see here, throughput's pretty high. And basically you'll see in the, in the bottom graph here that the, the server's stable. It's just fine, fine tuning, it's happy. There's no real issues. But what I want to sort of start wrapping up with is, so now the site's big. It's actually bigger than we've ever anticipated. There's been a thousand percent growth in sales over these short amount of years. At peak times, we can get, we can get hundreds of transactions a minute. On average, we have three to four transactions a minute, 24-7. Can Wu cope with this? And can it continue to cope with this? My answer is yes. I think it can have tenfold plus more. I don't see the limits yet. We've been under the bonnet. We've ripped it apart. We've seen the issues. Yes, there's more optimizations that we can do. There's heaps more that we can do. I'm excited to talk with anyone more about what we can do on that, that front. And we're super excited to see what this journey brings us next. And on that note, thanks. <laughs>